Welcome to Wine for Normal People, the podcast for people who like wine, but not the snobbery that goes with it. I'm your host, Elizabeth Schneider, author of the Wine for Normal People book and certified wine dork. And I'm MC Ice, just a wine-loving normal person. This podcast is sponsored by Wine Access. Get on the Wine Access Black Friday sale with my picks this week. Do not miss the opportunity of getting 15% off these amazing wines that you are going to love all holiday season and beyond. WineAccess.com slash WFMP. Listen in the middle of the show for more details. Okay, this is not just a re-release of episode 327. I have edited down some of the information from the original show with Barnaby Eels. And then MC Ice and I have added a whole bunch of new information about what is going on because wine ingredient labeling in the EU is going into effect on December 8th, 2023. And this is a really important thing for all of us to be aware of. I need to give a huge shout out to patron Sarah Horton. She was the one who brought this to my attention that the producers have less than a month to get these new labeling requirements under control. So here's the deal. There's going to be the episode with Barnaby cut down to about 25 minutes. And then MC Ice and I come on at the end of the show and we will discuss what is going on now and all of the very important things that you need to know. So take a listen. As we say at the end of the episode, we're probably going to need to do this Yet again, it's really not that long, but we did want to make sure that we informed you of new news on this show. Barnaby Eels does a great job of framing it. So listen to that first part of the show and then make sure you stick around and listen to what is going on right now. Super important stuff. Very cool. And now we'll get to the show. Today on the show, we are so lucky to have Barnaby Eels. He is a multilingual journalist. He speaks like 5 million languages and he's very modest about it. He has a WSET certification. He is a news editor who's traveled extensively on international assignments. Then in 2015, he switched over to reporting on wine. He has contributed stories to Club Enologique, Wine Searcher, Harper's, Voyage Magazine, World Travel, Wine Merchant Magazine, The Drinks Business, and Decanter. He is very, very well-schooled on the topic that we're going to talk about because I found him through an article in Wine Searcher. Barnaby wrote this fantastic article about what is going on with the EU and wine ingredient labeling. And he is going to talk to us today about that. Thank you so much for being here, Barnaby. Let's start with background. The EU is trying to get more transparency around nutrition and ingredient labeling. And and to be clear, I mean, this is an issue in the UK. This is an issue in the US. This is a topic that's bandied about a lot. In 2017, the EU put their foot down and said, look, you have a year to figure out nutrition and ingredient labeling. And producers put something forward that they were not satisfied by. So now there is a debate. There's a lot of different sides to this. Could you frame the debate here for us when, and the different sides and the different positions, please? Yeah, sure. European wine producers, both small and large, have agreed to list ingredients. However, yeah, there is consumer groups and health care groups who, uh, who think um, what they would like to list does not go far enough in terms of nutritional and the ingredient labeling. But actually, the wine producers actually want to list ingredients because they want legal certainty. So they, they're not opposed to having mandatory rules at all. But there's some, you know, there are some <clears throat> discrepancies over which substances should be classified as ingredients. And the point of view of the side. So there's the EC, who is the moderating body, right? Yes. So you have current negotiations between the EC um, legislators and industry. This will drum up some draft legislation. And then you have the lobbying groups who will, you know, obviously try to water it down, I imagine. But we don't have any draft legislation at the moment. However, we're already seeing how this is a very sort of conflictive issue. Is it consumers in the EC, in the European community, that are like, we want this to happen? Who's driving this change? How did this become such a hot button issue? It is an odd thing that. Every other product that people put in their mouths is labeled except wine and spirits and beer. Absolutely. Yes. Well, historically, um, wine industry was opposed to having ingredients listed labels. But now they've changed 
they've shifted, which is quite a major shift. Um, there's also, you know, obviously, consumer groups, you know, like Eurocare and um, European Public Health Alliance, who push have been pushing for labeling of ingredients and nutritional information for some years. Wine drinkers actually care about this. That's the motivation behind this. Consumer groups actually care. Because there's some question, and I, I think we have this in the United States especially, there's some question as to whether or not anybody actually cares and whether it's actually going to make a difference. Well, that I think, yes. I'd say many consumers don't care, or it's also a question of information. You know, they'd not, I think many people aren't actually aware what, how wine is made or what is in it or what's, what brilliance are found in the end product. So most consumers probably aren't that concerned that there's an increasing number of consumers who are concerned. And I think it's a natural evolution from what we've seen with food. People want to know what, what you know, have healthy diets and, and they want to know what's in their food. And that's just a natural evolution and to go on to alcohol beverages. In the article, you were talking about how there's Italian trade groups and Southern French industry associations that are launched this thing called In Vino Veritas, which is yep. essentially, well, okay. what, so what's their goal? With the COVID-19 pandemic, their plans have been um, postponed, but they are going to launch during the course of the year. And there is actually a In Vino Veritas campaign in Sweden already. It's been launched by consumer groups, which suggests there is a kind of um, European wide move to have more information about uh, one ingredient. Is there some ulterior motive here or is it just they just really want consumer information? Is there something to be gained by this or is it just literally transparency? I mean, people just really um, don't know. On one hand, it's transparency. Then you have the specific interests of certain lobbying groups, like, for example, must, um, great must from suppliers. They want fewer and fewer producers to use sugar to increase alcohol levels, for example, they would prefer them to use um, rectified, uh, concentrated grape must. Okay. So they have an interest in that. So, would, but would um, listing if sucrose was on, on labels, would that the producers to use by more expensive rectified, concentrated grape must? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so, when they're looking at adding ingredient labeling, what kinds yeah. of things would be red flags? on the label. Are there things that people are like, wow, if we put that on the label, that's really going to look bad for us? Or is it just... I think it's from these producer groups, lobbying groups, is that they're concerned that there are 22 substances listed as additives. So you could have a long list of additives on your labels, which might be quite off-putting to consumers. Well, let's talk about that definition, though, because you write in the piece that there's a difference between additives for winemaking that can be changed in winemaking, like capitalization, and then there's items that are actually in the finished wine. And there's this definition issue. If you look at the ingredients on bread, they put yeast in it. They mm -hmm. put yeast in it, and yeast is on the ingredient label. At least here it is. What would be the difference between these two things? Well, processing is are substances uh, which are not consumed as, as an ingredient by itself. So it's, it's used in the processing of raw materials or to fulfill a certain technological purpose during a treatment or processing. So it may result in unintentional but technically unavoidable presence of residues or traces on the substance in the final product, but they don't have any impact. So there's a difference between processing aids and additives. What other food is there that where we have this? Is there some other thing that we could use this as an example? For sure. Absorbic acid, for example, like in food, it's used, say, apple pies. Um, it, it's used to prevent the discolorization of fruit in apple pie, but it has no effect once you've taken it out of the oven. But so, does it still go on the label? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, there's sulfites in food. There's gum arabic used in food, which is used in wine as well. There are plenty of cases where it's been used in food as well as wine. It seems like there would be no reason not to put that stuff on since it's in all the other foods. And yet there's this debate about you have your mega purple, mega red. So do you add that as a, an ingredient or an additive? It, it, would that yes. be required? Well, well um, what I understand is that substances are classified as additives will be listed as ingredients. So we'll be able to see all of that? Yes, yes, you will. Yeah. Well, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Clarifying agents are considered as processing agents, so you wouldn't see those listed. The, the vegans are out of luck because eyes and glass and egg yolks are not going to be listed. That's right, yeah. That's not great. But there, there is no draft legislation at the moment, so this is just what sources tell me. This comes from the list of approved 
magical practices, which came into force in December 2019 in the U- European Union, which lists about 82 substances and about a quarter of those are additives. Oh my gosh. There's a long list. This is the thing. When you compare, say, beer or spirits, so beer has, say, what, four ingredients, main ingredients. So there's already been a memorandum of understanding with the European Union for beer producers. They've agreed to list the ingredients, you see, and on label. Whereas spirits also have a memorandum of understanding, but they'll only have to list 66% of ingredients, but off label via, you know, QR codes. So there are different agreements according to alcoholic beverage, you see. So is wine the most adulterated beverage? (laughs) I mean, is that really what you're saying? Is that when we drink wine, the process is most adulterated? More that can go on that the consumer may not be aware of. In principle, there should be this transparency. However, there are practical implications. I won't actually put any rules into practice. There's a whole argument about whether you should have a list of ingredients on the back level or whether it should be by a QR code. Industry critics say, you know, no one's going to read it. No one's going to get a phone out and uh, read, click on the QR code. Oh, I mean, how, how much time does the average consumer spend when they purchase a bottle of wine? A few seconds, maybe. Do they look at back labels even? Um, so even if you do, if you finally get these rules when you, where the producers have to list their ingredients, then it's not certain um, this would make any difference to the consumers. So why are they even bothering? I think it's a question of like, principle, really. And I think people should be able to make choices, you know, uh, well-informed choices. So you spoke to Dr. Simone Luce, who is the head of wine and beverages at Geisenheim University, which is one of the most esteemed wine centers for education in the world in Rheingau in Germany. And yes. what did she say? What she said was that there had to be some legal certainty. So had, this had to be cleared up, this issue of which product should be ingredients. Yeah. Because a lot of everyone agrees. So that's that's one important issue to be resolved. It seems like the EC is also saying that they do not trust wine producers to be transparent. I haven't heard them say that. Well, see, it just seems like from the way that they keep pushing back on them, there's an argument going on between the producers who are saying we don't want to put certain things on and the EC saying you have to. Or the EC saying that's, that doesn't go far enough and them saying, well, it does go far enough because we're not going to do this. And the reason I'm asking about this is because I do know that especially small producers are very hesitant to do this, not because they have something to hide, but because they're worried about all the paperwork and the... Well, there's the costs involved because they would have to pay for this. And there's the question of translating ingredients into different languages. That's one of the concerns voiced by some of the smaller producers. So there's a lot of tedium there. But, but then on the other side, there are people saying, well, consumers want to know about this. But then the third thing is you're talking about the QR codes. If you put ingredients on a QR code, nobody really will ever see that. It seems like the producers, except for the fact that it's a lot of work for them, really have nothing to win or lose from this debate unless Barnaby Eels decides to do an expose, for instance, on all of the sketchy things that are in wine now that it's come out. Well, I mean, wine is heavily regulated in the EU, that's true, but I just don't I just think that consumers don't know this. So I think you will see a consumer campaign by producers, I think, in the future, explaining why certain additives are used and and the benefits of them, why salt is a good thing. What about residual sugar? That is one of the biggest things that I hear from wine drinkers and from myself as well. We look at something like Alsace. There are a lot of California wines. There's a lot of residual sugar in the wines, and not all of them have a dryness scale in Alsace. That's all by producer. That would be something people would be quite interested in. Is that going to be on the label, or is that how would you find that out? I suspect that would come under the nutritional information in terms of energy value. Calories. Yes, and the sugar. That's part of the negotiations as well, the extent to what we should put down the sugar from residual sugar um, in the nutritional information. And the nutritional information would be what's actually in the finished wine. Well, nutritional information will be energy values, the calories, but also you can have, yeah, you can have the amount of sugar. You could list yeah, the amount of residual sugar. That would be great because then people would know what they were in for. I mean, one of the big problems that I know people have is that when you buy a wine and you think that it's dry, we see this with New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. We see, I mean, there, there are so many people that leave residual sugar in the wine 
and then you get something very unexpected, especially at the lower end. And right. so things like that would be helpful. I think there is a distinction, though, between the nutritional information, which to me says this is what's in the finished wine, and the ingredient list, which says this is all in the back end. So do you think that they would consider doing a split where they put the nutritional information on the bottle and then put the ingredient list on the QR code? Has that been discussed at all? Or all of it would go on the QR? That's a good question. I think that's part of the negotiations. I mean, all other foodstuffs have to list their ingredients and nutritional information on the labels. Right. So they would legally need an exemption to have a, a, any split or part of the information on, on QR codes. Here is more of a theoretical question, which is about natural wine. You know about the natural wine movement, obviously. Yes. And they often vilify conventional wine and say uh-huh. that it is full of additives and it is really terrible and nobody should be drinking it and conventional producers are horrible. Will this, will it bolster their position or is it going to take the wind out of their sails? Because a lot of conventional producers don't use anything that much different from natural wine producers, except for sulfur to prevent microbial spoilage. Is it going to totally take the wind out of their sails for natural wine producers because they keep saying conventional wine is so terrible? Could it backfire on them? I'm not so sure it's that would be the case, really, um, um, what, what the sort of implications would be. Because if you talk to some producers, then they say, you know, they may lead some producers to change their habits if they have, if they see their sales fall because they have li- they're listing 20 odd additives on their labels. They may change their habits in terms of wine making. But I don't think this would impact on the natural wine. I think that will continue to grow organic, quite direct, and that natural wine will production will continue to increase. Well, certainly there's a difference between biodynamic and organic, which is farming, and natural wine, which really concerns more about production, because they don't think that organic and biodynamic are enough. They want no sulfur in the wine and no ingredients in the wine, really. That's part of natural wine. They omit people who are biodynamic and organic because that's on the growing side. And so the interesting thing will be to see producers who do organic and biodynamic viticulture and then really don't add that much to the wine except for shelf stability, will all of a sudden this be like, well, that means that there's a lot of people that actually fit into the natural wine movement if you change the definition a bit. My sense is that a lot of small producers are not using, especially, are not using many of the additives that could be available. It's a lot of the large producers who use the things that that are vilified. What do you think about that? Yes, but I think that there should be more information for the consumer. Some of these additives, preservatives, or can be a good thing yeah. in wine production. So they're not necessarily bad things. Um, I think there should be a consumer campaign to state you know, the actual role of these additives. What's their role and what, what's, what are the benefits? And so they're not necessarily bad things always. And it's not a black and white scenario. No, but it seems to be painted that way a lot. We think... There's the bad stuff and then there's the good stuff. And I think that there's much gray area in between. I think the the ultimate change could be exactly as you said, maybe the producers will have to change because they're adding things that people don't want. Then again, if you look at food, people eat plenty of junk food. So why wouldn't they drink junk wine? Absolutely, yes. A lot of people, I don't I'm not bothered about what, what their wine's made of or how it's, how it's made or or about taste and if they like it or well, not for many people. Do you think that because wine is already so confusing for wine drinkers that this is going to make it even worse? <laughs> um, I mean, people have a hard time picking varietals that they like and regions that they like. This is just another thing. And to your point, if they start doing the education campaign, that's going to confuse things even more, isn't it? Yes, it could do. It could do. But I think it's a, it's a positive thing to, to be transparent and to explain reasons why certain things are used. You've traveled all over the world. You've, you've reported from all these different countries. Do you think any one country in Europe is going to be affected more than another? Now, the EU, obviously, there are already pretty strict regulations. The people that are against this are saying, we are already so regulated it doesn't matter. But th- the fact of the matter is they may still be regulated, but what is regulated is yields and certain production methods. They don't necessarily say you can't put in. I mean, capitalization is definitely monitored, 
but they don't tell you the precise amount of sulfite you're allowed to put in a wine or oh, any yeah, other additives, yeah. do they? There, there are limits. There are legal limits to, to how much sulfite you put in. There's a whole list of rules and analogical practices. Yeah, it is heavily regulated. You can't put limitless amounts of sulfur. In the new world, you can. <laughs> right. Well, not in the EU. Um, I think it's just people don't realize how regulated it is or why these um, sort of things are used. We're seeing the issue here. The EU is always tends to be a couple steps ahead in terms of consumer transparency. The best example that I can think of is cosmetic testing on animals. Right. That is illegal in the EU. And they're way ahead on their thinking. And we see in the U.S., yeah, there's some people every now and then that try to introduce bills through our Congress that... You know, try to stop cosmetic testing on animals, but we don't see it going through. So is something like this going to change? Because, you know, you have half of the wine world. Well, probably not half, but a lot of the wine world is in new world countries. They have really very little regulation except don't poison people. Anybody that imports into the EU is now going to have to put this stuff on the label. And the question is, now does that mean... Everybody else is going to start to do it. Are there going to be pushes in other countries or will e- the EU be the only ones that do this? Also, will they include the information on products that they export? And is that part of this discussion also? It certainly seems to be the case that this this will have an impact on exports into the, the EU. So new wild wines coming into the EU may be impacted by this. But as we don't have the draft legislation yet we it's hard to know but that could well be the case and then you you do see you know when the eu um, holds uh, trade negotiations with other areas third party countries they do like to um, push their values across on their products so that may well be the case um, it could be an opportunity for advocates of, of labeling labeling in other areas of the world to um Step up that game. I could see it being a big issue here in the U.S. because there are a number of people that really are very interested in having nutrition information on the label at minimum calories and sugar and things like that. And obviously ingredients because we have things that are legal here that you don't have there. And I think that it could be worse from the new world than from the old world because we don't have a classification system. We don't have the regulations. Really, it's just it has to be good enough for human health. You can't injure somebody through it. But in the United States, the people that run our alcohol regulation are the Tax and Trade Bureau, not agriculture. Right. Yes. This is going to fall under the common agricultural policy in the EU. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. And so it'll be regulated. It'll just be sort of an additional regulation with that which they already have all the regulations for DO, DOCG, you know, DOC, DOCG, or AOC. I mean, all of the European classifications are already there, and this will just be another thing. And it will be regulated, and I'm sure there'll be spot checks. Yes, I, I think that they'd have to make sure it was implemented and if the implementation was controlled. Yeah, you've got no regulators hanging around in the U.S. or New Zealand or Australia. <laughs> right. So... It may very well be that the EU stands alone in this. I wonder if it will mean that fewer producers will export to the EU. What do you think about that? I'm not sure. Because if, say, let's say, for example, where the listing of ingredients has very little impact on consumption trends, then I don't think that would be an issue. I don't think it'll have an impact on the consumption trends, but we were talking before about the costs of having to do it. Right. That is an issue. If you look in, you know, what's happening with the pandemic, then producers are worried, you know, about the loss of trade. Will they want to spend more on uh, labeling? I think that could be an unintended consequence, except if it's a giant market. The other question I have is, do you think the UK will implement this because you're no longer part of the EU? I, I don't really know. That's the answer to that. I don't know what would happen. I don't think anybody knows what's going on with the UK right now. No offense. <laughs> <laughs> is that a fair assessment? <laughs> the island on their own again. You guys are on your own. But it's unclear about how much of the... EU regulations will transfer over to the UK and whether or not the requirements of the EU will also be requirements in the UK. The reason I bring it up is because the UK is such a large wine market and so many people people export there, right? Like, I mean, there's a huge market for Chilean wine and Australian wine and New Zealand wine and a growing market for US wine and South African wine. So 
if the UK does not adopt these wine labeling principles and it turns out that it's just too onerous for the producers, it could be a reason why the UK would not adopt it because yes. they would lose a lot of their import market if, if people like bought. The, yes, that's, that's right. Yeah, the current British government at the moment is, seems to be keen on deregulation and having less rules. You have all of this stuff that needs to be figured out. What is the timeline for when they need to figure this out by? Is there a timeline? Well, it's, it should be post-2020, so 2020, 2021. There's, it's basically part of the forms to the common agricultural policy. So that's the kind of legal, you know, that's where it fits in legally. But that could drag on for some years. <laughs> yeah, like everything in the EU, right? I mean, there was some disagreement, I understand, about labeling one ingredients in the late 70s, and, and we're still here talking about it now. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so there, it, there's a possibility that this could never happen. Or do you think now, because more people are on it, it will happen? This is the interesting I mean, it is going to happen, and it's happening soon. But it's, it, to what extent it will happen, it, would it be watered down? Um, you know, have all the lobbying groups in Brussels. You know, when you talked about the natural one, I think, you know, when I talk to the People in that way, they don't want to spend time lobbying themselves in, in Brussels. Their lot is really thrown in with the consumer groups. Yes. So they can leave it to them to no, of to yes. it the consumer groups are in their health. And yeah, they think that you should have things like, you know, this, this alcohol can cause cancer on labels. Something that wine producers obviously don't want. This is a super interesting debate. We will keep an eye on this and definitely follow up with you when things wind up finally resolving. I think that the most really salient point here is that this is going to keep on going. They will hammer it out. Yes, I think so. But uh, what we end up seeing is another thing, you know, will be maybe watered down. For consumers, as long as there was some nutritional calorie information in the residual sugar so we could know what we were getting before we had the bottle, I think even that would be a big stride in the right direction, especially for some of those wines where you're just not sure what the flavor profile is. And the only information that you have to go on is the alcohol. And that tells you body, but it doesn't tell you sugar. Hopefully mm -hmm. that, at least that will be on there. Yes. And cheers to transparency. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. With that, this has been another episode of Wine for Normal People. Thank you so much for listening and we'll catch you next time. Super interesting show. I am so glad that we are re-releasing this. I think you're going to be very excited to hear the end of the show when we talk about the stuff that's happening now. And one other thing that you should be excited about is the Black Friday sale from Wine Access. Go to wineaccess.com slash WFMP and you will get a page of my picks that is going to show you the amazing wines that are for sale on Black Friday where you'll get 15% off your order. Whether you've ordered before or not, you will be getting that 15% off on this awesome sale. The team, I've been working with them a lot. They are all experts in wine. They all have extensive years of wine buying and relationships with producers and distributors and importers, and they pick the best wines. And that's the thing. They are going to give you access to things you can't get elsewhere. So go for it. Make that order today. If you have never ordered from Wine Access, this is your time. Think about joining the Wine Access Wine for Normal People Wine Club because we are continuing it next year. And I'll tell you, some of the stuff we've got planned for next year, it's amazing. Wineaccess.com slash normal to join the wine club and wineaccess.com slash WFMP. When you are cyber searching on Friday and you are looking for great Black Friday deals, don't forget the wine. Don't forget the thing that later on you're going to say, oh, darn, I could have gotten that for 15% off. Stock up. Get a couple of cases. You will not regret it. Wineaccess.com slash WFMP. Have a lovely and brilliant Thanksgiving. Whatever you are doing, know that we are thankful for you. I want to give a special shout out to the patrons. P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Wine for Normal People. We so appreciate you. We had an amazing time at a live patron event in New Hampshire. If you join Join. These are the kinds of things that you will get access to. These are true, true community events. That is what patreon.com slash wine for normal people will get you. Join today. It is the price of a bottle of wine for an entire year of membership. 
Think about it. Also, wine for normal people.com slash classes. The sparkling wine class is going up and it is ready for you to register. What a fun class on December 30th. And then you'll have the wines for New Year's Eve. Get on it today. And also don't forget wine for normal people.com slash classes is also where you can buy gift certificates for people who would be interested in taking a dorky fun live wine class with me and a group of amazing people. Now let's get back to the show. Okay, so we set up the show at the beginning, did the podcast with Barnaby, and now here we are. MC Ice and I are going to take you through what has happened since that show in 2020. Exciting. It's kind of interesting that we are able to do this, relaunch that show, and then just give a really quick update here. It was a short show, so this is sort of our add-on to it. Well, it's great that there's actually been some forward movement on it and something to talk about. So Barnaby said in the show, this was definitely happening, and he wasn't lying. Let's just, again, frame it. 20 years ago, they were talking about ingredient and nutrition labeling for food within the EU. It became mandatory to protect and inform consumers. They started discussing it vis-a-vis alcohol. Beer and spirits voluntarily put nutrition labeling on their packages. Wine did not. So now... The EU has forced wine to do this, and this is the deal. It's like USB-C for iPhones. So, right? Oh, man, I hope they do do that. No, they that's, did. Oh, they that's did? What, they that's forced? Because how many new cords are they going to come up right, with Right, no, every that's day? why Apple's uh, the iPhone 15, I guess, uh, has USB-C, because the EU forced them into it. Well, I mean, how much waste can they? Anyway, right. that's a whole other story. Anyway, the Food Information to Consumers Regulation... Alcoholic beverages containing more than 1.2% of alcohol by volume were exempted from the obligation to bear a nutrition declaration and a list of ingredients. That has now changed. So under the revision for the common agricultural policy, which wine falls under agriculture in the EU, this is now changing. Is there a minimum alcohol threshold that it applies to? No, that 1.2% was just basically all wine was exempted Uh, exempted before. But now every wine is included. On December 6th, 2021, the European Union made new rules. And that's concerning wine, dealcoholized and partially dealcoholized wine, and aromatized wine. And the new rules make a compulsory nutrition declaration and list of ingredients for wine products sold in the EU market beginning, and this is why we're doing this show, Mm -hmm. on December 8th, 2023. This is happening. That's no time to react. This has been planned. The producers have known that this is coming. Beginning on December 8th of this year, any wine product produced and or bottled after that date in the EU has to have ingredient information. And this is what it's going to have. And let me just say this. It's going to have scary pictures of like decrepitated livers. And... No, no, okay. no. That, that's a separate thing. This is about the nutrition labeling. Okay. It's going to affect all European winemakers and anyone who is importing into the EU. So if you're an American winery and you oh. import your wine into any place wow. in the Schengen zone, you have to do this also. Oh, that's interesting. If it was produced and labeled after December 8th, you have to declare any ingredient added during the winemaking process that is in the finished wine. This is going to include sulfur dioxide. It's going to include commercial yeast. It's going to include added sugar. Yay. We're going to know that now. Added acidity, uh, colorants, mega, mega purple. It's great. Full information, nutrition information. Like any other processed food, there are certain mandatory things on the bottle. You have to have, as is now, alcohol content, Mm -hmm. possible allergens, including sulfite, the sulfite statement, bottle size, which Mm -hmm. is there. The calorie value has to be on there. That was the first thing I was thinking of. The ingredient list has to be on there. So antifreeze. And then the (laughs) box with the proteins and sugars and things like that. But it is going to look like a food nutrition label. Here's the other thing. You also are going to have to have, I mean, you can have a fold out on your label and include everything, Mm -hmm. but you have to have a full nutritional table of ingredients on an e-label, which is from a QR code. QR code, okay. Oh, that's smart. So this is something that we discussed in the podcast with Barnaby, where I said, well, nobody's going to look at that. Most people aren't, but we may. We may be interested in looking at that QR code. After COVID and Mm. people getting used to QR code menus, Maybe they will. 
Maybe they will. We don't know. But the label has to be translated into languages of any country where you sell it. The e-label has to be up for as long as there's any bottles that are still sold. So again, a huge cost to the wineries. They're going to have to keep these e-labels up, these sites. And this is the thing. You can't collect any user data. They can't collect Google Analytics. You can do location because of the language, Mm -hmm. but that's it. No marketing. This is a plain page that has to look the same no matter what. It can say what your wine is, and then it has to have just this very plain thing. So you are required to maintain this. No navigation. So the user should not have to click to get to another page with the information. It's got to go directly to that page. You don't have to sort through a bunch of submenus to get to it. No, it has to be 100% apparent. You can also put the information on your website, but it must meet all of those requirements. So this is happening. The things that are still up in the air that we'll have to add on to at another time. One, we don't know what the education element is going to be or whether the consumer is going to give a crap. So this is something Barnaby and I talked about. We still don't know what the rollout of this is going to look like and whether or not the EU is going to try to do a big consumer education campaign about what is in that and the benefits of looking at a QR code or whether they're making all of these producers go through the hassle for a very small handful. However, I appreciate it because I am one of those handful. Yeah, I, I, I think it's I great. I think more information, better. And the fact that they are handling it digitally, I think, was a brilliant move. Because I could see where if you've got a, every producer has to create these fold-out tables, that's going to get very expensive, very difficult to maintain. But updating a digital page. Well, is you actually be never easy. update it because remember that it has to stay there for the life of the wine oh, as long as right. you sell the wine. You just have to keep making yeah, more make, and you, more. You just, and well, more. then you just duplicate it for the next year and right. tweak it a little bit. Okay. They, they don't take up a lot of memory or whatever. Right. And if you have a WordPress site, it's easy to add a page. But anyway, we still don't know whether the campaign is going to backfire and drive more people away from wine. Is it going to be a positive thing? Is it going to make people more comfortable? I certainly hope it makes people more comfortable. How about the US? The US now doesn't have any regulations on this. They have talked about it before. Do we know whether or not Australia or Chile or Argentina or South Africa or the U.S. is going to follow this? We don't know. We don't know whether or not they will. I hope they will, but we don't know. Now what's going to happen is that small producers aren't going to change their bottles for the U.S. market. Those bottles are going to come in here with those QR codes, and we're going to learn how to use them and there's going to be a lot of heat on these U.S. Right. producers. Right, there's going to be a lot of pressure on them. Yes. And, well, and it's it seems logical, though, that since California leads the U.S. in these kinds of consumer advocacy programs, there's such a, a vibrant wine industry there that I could see them making similar moves in this direction. The wine producers have fought it really, really hard. So we don't know. There's some that are on the side of it, some that aren't. Remember that when... These French and Italian and German and Spanish and Portuguese producers and European producers, when they export their goods into the U.S., it's possible that this stuff could not be on the label also. Not required by law. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's going to show up in the U.S. I think it would make it very hard on U.S. producers if the other folks do it. You're saying that the European producers would create one label for the European market and one for the United States? Well, they have to anyway because of the language differences and things like that. So they have to make different labels for everything. Yeah. Usually it's just a translation thing, right? You just translate it into another language. So my hunch is they'll probably keep the information. More information is better. And I think since they're going through the trouble, why not? Right? It's a great selling point for them. And I think it'll really make a difference. So the other question is, will the UK implement this? The UK is no longer part of the EU. Mm -hmm. Brexit has taken care of that. They are talking about implementing it. They also make wine. Will they require it as the stuff comes in? If they require the same ingredient labeling on the European producers and of their own producers, then there is a significant chance that the U.S. will also see yeah, these. Yeah, that so makes sense. because it's already in English, and I'm sure that you know if they're paying for the translation mm-hmm. services already, it's going to be pretty much translated. If the U.K. does require it. That also means the UK is a massive market for all New World wines also. Right. All of their commonwealths are then going to have to do that. So then at that point, does that force the issue? And so then everybody in wine. Effect, yeah. yeah. So it would just be the US holding out, but then everybody else would do it. And mm-hmm. then at that point, I think consumers would really advocate for it. So we will see what happens. All I can tell you right now is expect this. 
starting on December 8th, that is in two weeks, when we go to Europe, or if you are located in Europe, we will see calorie, sugar, additive information either on the label, the calorie information Mm -hmm. absolutely will be on the label, which thank God, I mean, I'm just so happy to show people that wine is not highly caloric. Right. And then it's going to have the QR code where you can find out more information about it. I think for all of us who are wine dorks, who also are, are concerned about residual sugar in our wine and maybe other additives in our wine, it is going to be a great thing. So hopefully they will keep those labels and they will wind up coming here to the U.S. and being in the same format so that we can appreciate it. But certainly when you are in Europe, you will see a change on the back of every label. You're going to have to make a poll question about this in a, in a few months to get people's attitude. Regardless, I think that more transparency for most of us mm-hmm. is a really good thing. It is difficult for the producers. It is expensive for the producers. But once you start the process, I think that it will be a good thing. The only open questions are, is it going to be bad for wine? Is it going to be good for wine? Is it going to be something that spreads around the world? Or is it going to be something that is just contained within the EU? But keep in mind, the EU contains the top three wine producing countries in the world, Mm -hmm. the US being the fourth largest. They make more wine in the EU than anywhere else. So this is a significant thing. Going back and listening and just doing a a light edit on the show with Barnaby, Mm -hmm. these questions that he and I had, many of them have been resolved. So I just wanted to give you an idea of what was going on. I think this is very fascinating. I hope that we get to do another build onto the show again. I'm looking forward to uh, when this is re-released in two or three years and we get to see what's happening in the new world. I mean, honestly, I don't think it makes sense to redo the whole show altogether because it's really just building on, building on, building on. So here we are three years later and this is happening. Keep a tab on this. I think that it is worthwhile. I think it's great consumer protection. It's a bit weedy and complicated. I understand that. But one thing that's not weedy and complicated is we do understand the nutrition labeling. Yep. Many of us do look it's a at great that. Thing. And I think overall, it's a great thing. And, and the other open question, the final open question is, which I did ask Barnaby and we, we sort of bandied it about, is Is this going to force producers who put a lot of additives in their wines Mm -hmm. to stop? Yeah, that would be really interesting. Right. So is the pressure of people looking on these sites Mm -hmm. and saying, and then potentially showing others, Right. is that going to clean up wine a little bit? We're not going to go into the natural wine thing, but will it be that there's a consumer education campaign about sulfites, which are important for keeping wine shelf stable. Yep, yep. Is it going to be that people are going to notice colorants like mega purple? Mega the, purple? Yes, mega purple is the what? major. It's a, it's concentrated great it, anyway, it doesn't matter. But the point is will will is they have like to put things like that they're trying to elbow. <laughs> my God, stop with the mega purple. No, but will they have to put in things like Velcrin, which are literal poison that oh, it goes geez. into the wine? Or will that be considered something that dissipates out? I don't know. I will tell you, if you, you, I hope you listen to the first part of the podcast. Vegans are still out of luck because egg whites are taken out of the final product in wine. So it will not say if it's been fined or filtered using animal oh, products. Oh, that's disappointing. Yeah, hmm. eyes and glass, which is fish bladders. So yeah, there's that. But there are a lot of people who are now labeling their wines as vegan as well. All right, so that is the update. Super interesting. We will keep you posted on Patreon about what is going on. And then if anything changes, we will just do another add-on. It's going to be a hot topic for a while, I think. Absolutely. And with that, this has been another, another episode (laughs) of Wine for Normal People. Thank you so much for listening, and we will catch you next time.